Tales from the Break Room is a viewer submission podcast, and I want to hear your scariest true work stories. Send me your scary work story at eeriecast.com slash submit. And if we narrate it on the show, we'll pay you five cents per word via PayPal. Follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts to help us reach new people to scare the espresso out of. Thank you. Hi, welcome to Dead and Roasted. What can I get you? Hey, welcome back. I've got quite a few extra sharp stories to share with you today. Machetes, knives, and blades galore. So if you think I was talking about extra sharp cheddar, go to your room and think about what you've done. The rest of you grab your peppermint lattes and join me on my break. I've got allegedly true and scary work stories about highway horrors and basement boogeymen. These are tales from the break room. Never Stop for Anyone from Tithe Fighter Look, I've been a regional manager for a specific convenience store chain for over a decade now. But there's one night I can't shake from my memory, no matter how hard I try. Four years back, when I was 32, something happened on a late night drive between two of our store locations. The purpose of the trip was simple, just some checking and verification of product manifests. It's the sort of task I've done hundreds of times by then, maybe even more. But that night, it was different. By that point, I'd been with the company for eight years, worked my way up to where I was. I knew the routes like the back of my hand, but the highway I drove down that particular evening felt off. I mean, sure, I've had drives where there weren't many cars around, but this was complete isolation. Not a single headlight or taillight in sight. Just me, my car, and the road ahead. I'd always preferred the quiet during these drives but the unsettling loneliness was actually getting to me. To distract myself, I decided to turn on the radio, even though I usually avoided doing it. You see, my car speakers were busted and emitted this irritating buzzing sound that never failed to get on my nerves. But at the time, I figured that buzz was better than the quiet. The tunes were generic, something I'd heard on every other station a million times, but it was background noise, and I appreciated it. Driving along, trying to hum to the tunes, my eyes caught something odd in the distance. On the shoulder of the road, there was a shape. I squinted, trying to make out what it was. My headlights slowly began to illuminate the scene, and as I got closer, the shape took on the form of a woman, dressed in all white, lying face down in the ditch. My heart raced. A million thoughts ran through my head. Was she hurt? Was there an accident? My foot instinctively eased off the gas pedal, slowing the car. I had to help. What if she needed medical attention? As I drew nearer, the reality of the situation began to sink in. I was alone on a desolate highway with a mysterious woman lying by the side of the road. The humming of the radio and the faint buzz from my busted speakers now seemed to be the only sounds in the world, contrasting sharply against the disturbing sight just ahead of me. It felt like a scene straight from a scary movie, and I had unwittingly become a part of it. The decision of what to do next weighed heavily on me, as the distance between my car and that woman shortened. After pulling over, I turned on my flashers, hoping their blinking might alert any other drivers to our presence. The overcast skies made the night especially dark, and a chill ran down my spine as I sat there in my car, the only sounds being the hum of the engine and the music-infused buzzing of my radio. I could not shake the gnawing feeling at the pit of my stomach, because something felt wrong, deeply wrong. But here was a person who might be hurt. I couldn't just drive away. Taking a deep breath, I mustered the courage to unlock and open my car door. My phone was in my hand, my thumb hovering over the 9 button, ready to dial for help. 
The cold night air stung my face as I made my way slowly to the motionless figure. Every step felt like an eternity, and the nagging sense of unease grew with each one. As I approached, I could make out more details. The woman's white dress was stained and tattered in places. Her long hair obscured her face, and I couldn't tell if she was breathing or not. I hesitated for a moment, thinking of what to say. Maybe a simple, hey, are you okay, would do. But before I could even utter a word, it all happened so fast. The woman's hand shot out, clutching my ankle with a grip that felt like iron. I barely had time to react before her other hand came into view, this one wielding a small knife. Panic surged through me. I tried to pull away, but she was quick, too quick. The sharp sting in my calf confirmed my worst fear. She had stabbed me. The pain was sharp and immediate. I yanked my leg away with all the force I could muster, feeling her grip loosen. My mind raced. I had to get back to my car. I had to get away, but with every step, the pain in my calf made it clear that running was not an option. All I could manage was a painful limp. Still reeling from the shock and pain, I managed to put some distance between me and that woman, desperately aiming for the safety of my car. But as if the situation wasn't terrifying enough, things took a turn for the even worse. The woman, now on her feet, began to scream a single word that echoed into the cold, empty air. Hurry! Hurry. Her voice was shrill and desperate like someone on the verge of madness. What happened next made my blood run cold. From the woods, I heard it, the unmistakable sound of footsteps, not one but multiple sets. It was as if an entire group was rapidly approaching, and by the sound of it, they were not far away. My mind raced, trying to make sense of the situation. Who were they? Why was she screaming for them to hurry? Hurry to do what? In my peripheral vision, I saw movement from the tree line, and what emerged will forever be etched into my mind. Three large men, their clothes also tattered and worn, burst from the woods. The moonlight glinted off the large machetes they each held. Their intentions were clear. Every instinct in my body screamed at me to get in my car and go. Ignoring the pain in my calf, I fumbled for my keys, practically throwing myself into the driver's seat. The engine roared to life, and without a second thought, I floored the gas pedal, my tires screeching against the asphalt. As I sped away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The three men had stopped. They stood next to the woman now, watching my car disappear into the night. The whole encounter felt like something out of a nightmare, but the burning sensation in my calf was a very real reminder of what had just transpired. It took me some time to process what happened, and even still a large chunk of skin on my calf is completely numb from some damaged nerves. I never did check those product manifests that night. I drove straight home, locked all my doors, tended to my wound until sunrise when I finally went to a hospital. For a long time, I was plagued by a barrage of questions. What did they even want? Was it just a twisted trap for unsuspecting motorists? A carjacking gone wrong or something even more sinister? To this day, I still have no definitive answers, but one thing's for sure. Night or day... I avoid that section of highway at all costs, and no matter how dire the situation looks on the road, I will never, ever stop for anyone again. That night taught me that sometimes the most ordinary situations can turn into your worst nightmare. I Almost Lost My Baby From Virginia this happened during one of my lunch breaks. At the time, I was four months pregnant. My work buddies decided to throw a small baby shower, as I was pretty new to the area, 
and I hadn't had the chance to make close friends yet. So I decided that day I should go home during lunch to drop off the lovely gifts they'd gotten for my daughter. At the time, I couldn't drive due to personal reasons, so I took a bus, which happened to be right in front of my workplace. As such, many other employees would take that bus all hours of the day. That day, two male employees I did not recognize, along with a tall Indian man with a tan suit, were waiting on the bus. The other employees took the only bench, so I decided to sit on the ground. Overall, I was just happy I was going to be able to show my wife the gifts my buddies at work had gotten for our daughter. Ignoring the people around me, I did what I usually did when waiting for the bus. I popped in an earbud in my only good ear and looked around. I remember listening to one of my favorite podcasts when I noticed a familiar tan suit moving closer to me. Carefully, I pulled out the earbud and looked at him, confused. Clearing his throat, he smiled and said, Sorry, how are you doing today? Giving my best customer service smile and voice, despite being off the clock, I replied, Oh, uh, pretty good. My friends threw me a surprise baby shower. I gestured to the bags in my hands. Thinking back, I guess I was pretty rude, because I never did ask how he was doing back. But to be honest, I just didn't care. I wasn't interested in being this random middle-aged man's friend. However, it didn't seem like my indifference mattered much, because he followed his first question with many more, slowly getting more and more personal, too. I soon felt creeped out. I answered each question simply and without extra details. I remember pleading with my eyes to my fellow co-workers for help. The two men clearly knew I was uncomfortable, but they stayed silent. Eventually, he asked me this. Could I take you to Starbucks? We did have a Starbucks right next door from the bus station. However, like I said, I was very pregnant and chose to stay away from all forms of caffeine. And also, I was not interested in going anywhere with this man. Um, no thank you. I can't have caffeine. I'm pregnant. He scoffed. Well, there's more than coffee there. Finally being fed up with the conversation, I silently looked around for the bus, willing it to appear out of the now dark parking lot. But then, once again, he asked, Could I take you to Starbucks? At this point, my feeble attempts to be friendly slipped away. I said no. Seemingly unfazed, he asked again, can I take you to Starbucks? He wasn't going to take no for an answer. Thankfully, my will seemed to finally make the bus appear. I didn't even care which bus it was, I just immediately went to stand up. That's when I felt it. A hand on my shoulder, pushing me hard onto the concrete ground I was just sitting peacefully on. Although shocked, I quickly turned to my side, taking much of the blow to my hip with a loud thud. With a soft, meaningless, oh sorry, the man scurried away, not even getting on the bus. My two co-workers quickly jumped onto the bus as I struggled to get up. I limped onto the bus and found myself trembling. A man I didn't know just pushed me onto the ground, belly first, nearly harming or killing my baby just because I wouldn't let him take me to Starbucks. If I'd landed wrong, I would have lost my daughter. I remember getting home just fine, but not without crying and telling my co-workers and my wife what had happened. I had a large, ugly bruise on my hip for a very long time after that, and to this day, I avoid the bus. My daughter joined us that following December. She's a very happy baby, and my wife says if she ever sees the man, she'll beat him half to death for hurting me, and for nearly hurting our daughter, all over a Starbucks date. Kindergarten from Hell From Matia H. This happened to me a few years ago, me and my fiancé Peter just moved into a new town. I was quite upset, 
because I missed my hometown. I'd spent my whole life there, but Peter and I needed a new start. And switching towns seemed like a good idea. Peter was an architect, and he worked mostly from home. He would spend hours in his room where he would draw up plans for new buildings, parks, houses, etc. On the other hand, I was a kindergarten teacher. I really loved working with kids. They're so innocent and so happy all the time. You just couldn't be sad around them. After moving into our new house, I went to the local kindergarten to try to apply for a job. Luckily for me, some old worker just retired last month, and they were looking for a replacement. I managed to get an interview three days later. In charge of the kindergarten was an older lady called Melissa. After a short interview, she said that she liked my spirit and smile, that I seemed like a very warm and kind person. She offered to take me around the building so I could become familiar with it. The kindergarten was medium-sized. It had four main rooms, the first being a playroom, where kids spent most of their time, well, playing. Then there was the kitchen, a bedroom, and room for staff. Outside, behind the kindergarten, there was a big playground. Now, upon entering the playroom, I saw tons of children playing, laughing, and making loud noises. There's no place like home, I said. They're wonderful, aren't they? Melissa said. Yeah, they really are, I replied. As we spoke, something caught my eye. Back in the corner of the room was a little boy, sitting all by himself. He wasn't speaking with anyone or playing with anything. He just sat in a small chair and looked at the wall. What's wrong with the boy there? I asked Melissa. Oh, that's Nolan. He's always like that. We don't know why we try to talk to him, but he never really answers. Can I try? Go ahead, she said. I walked over to Nolan and sat next to him. I tried asking him for a name, but he quickly just ran off. Now, I didn't want to push or scare him even more, so I just left him with Melissa. The next week, I officially started working there. My work on the one hand was very simple, but on the other hand, quite dynamic. Luckily, I had help from three great co-workers and Melissa. Our first task was to wait for parents to deliver their children. Then we had a few hours of playtime, followed by a nice homemade meal. I mentioned earlier that I really love kids, and that is true. But sometimes my favorite part of the day was when they were sleeping. One coworker would watch the kids sleep, and others would drink coffee in our room. Sometimes you just needed 15 minutes for yourself, you know? The kids got used to me very quickly. It was a small town, so everyone knew each other, which made the place all the more warmer. The only thing that worried me was Nolan. Over the course of the next few weeks, I kept a close eye on him. You see, I noticed that Nolan is always the first kid that comes in and the last kid that leaves kindergarten. I never met his parents because they never showed themselves. The poor kid always needed to walk to our parking lot where his car was parked. What kind of cold parent can you be, I asked myself, to not drive up and pick up your kid? One day on a lunch break, I asked one of my co-workers if she knew something about Nolan's parents. It's a small town. She'll probably know something, I thought. And she did. She said to me that Nolan's mother died last year. The police found her on the floor next to the stairs and presumed she'd fallen. But I don't really believe that, she added quietly. You see, her husband is the worst guy. I heard he drinks too much and he's aggressive much of the time. He even has history in the Mafia. I was shocked to hear that. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Well, did the police do anything about him? I asked. My coworker explained that neighbors had heard violent noises and screaming a few times in their house before, and they'd even called the police themselves at times. But his wife never said anything against him, so the police couldn't really do much. After that conversation, I looked at Nolan differently. Poor kid. 
If his father's abusing him, no wonder he's so withdrawn, I thought. In the days that followed, I put in extra effort in order to connect with Nolan. I was constantly trying to play a game with him or talk to him, but I always failed in my attempts. Until one day, Nolan fell from a swing. You see, the only thing Nolan liked were the swings on our playground. After Nolan fell, I quickly rushed over to him, and I saw that he had scratched his knee. Let me help you, I said. Naturally, he was scared, but eventually, he let me help him. He even told me thanks after that. It was a very big moment for me, because that was the first time I'd heard him speak. And even more, it was the first time I felt I'd reached him. From that day on, Nolan and I started playing on a daily basis. He still didn't want to talk much, but his letting me play with him was a big step forward for me. However, one thing still bothered me. His father. I still hadn't met him, as he was always waiting for Nolan in the car. I just wanted a little chat with his dad, just to see what my gut would say about him. My chance finally came on one rainy day. Nolan forgot his umbrella, so I asked him if I could take him to his car with mine. He, of course, hesitated a little, but eventually he agreed. When we got to his father's car, I opened the back door for him and came to the front to talk with his father. I had to knock on his window, and I bent down to talk with him. When his dad opened the window, I was shocked. He was a middle-aged man with a scarred and unshaven face. He wore dirty, ripped clothes, and the worst thing was he smelled like he hadn't washed himself for days. What shocked me even more were the three empty bottles of booze in the passenger seat. I was still shocked when he started to yell at me. So, what do you want? Why are you wasting my time? Speak. He was very mad. Well, your son forgot his umbrella, so I walked him to the car for you. There's really nothing else I need. The father continued. Nolan's a real man. A little rain can't hurt him. Now get away from here. I'm in a hurry. He then quickly drove away. During dinner with Peter, I was explaining what I'd experienced that day. I'm afraid he's abusing him. I need to do something. I need to go over to his house and get him out of there, I nervously said. You know you can't do that. He'll never let you in, and even if he does, what will you do? Just take his kid from him? He replied. Peter was right, but I also knew I needed to do something. Against Peter's wishes, I took his address from kindergarten and went to Nolan's house the very next day. I didn't know what I would do or even say, but I knew I had to do something. When I came to his house, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The house in which Nolan and his father lived couldn't even be called a house. It was an old building ready to collapse. I quickly came to the door and started to knock. Nobody answered, so I started to yell. And even then, no one answered. I waited there for about an hour before giving up and going home. For the next couple of weeks, things were the same, until one day something happened, something that keeps me awake to this day. It was a normal day just like any other. I finished setting up plates for the children to eat when I saw Nolan. I walked over to him and said hi, but then I noticed that he was crying. What's wrong, Nolan? I asked. It hurts, he replied. He held up his arm. I pulled up his sleeve and I saw bruises all over him. I was shocked. I tried asking what happened, but he didn't want to talk with me. In that moment, I decided to run to the office and I found the number for Nolan's father. I really didn't expect an answer, but he actually picked up. I told him I needed him to come in and sign some papers for Nolan. He agreed. I told my coworkers about it, and they said they would support me and help me confront the man. When Nolan's dad arrived, it was late, and all the children had already gone home except for Nolan, of course. 
I requested that Nolan wait in his dad's car as I led his dad to our office. My two coworkers joined me. So where are the darned papers? He asked. There are no papers. I just wanted to talk with you about something. Are you abusing your son? I asked. At that moment, he looked at me so seriously, I froze. What did you say? He asked. I believe that you are abusing your son, sir, and I will call the police. That moment I would remember for the rest of my life, because as I said that, he revealed a huge knife from his pocket and ran right towards me. He slammed me into the wall and choked me. I tried to free myself, but he overpowered me, and as he choked me, my coworker took a vase and smashed it against his head. That temporarily knocked him down, and I was able to escape him. But the moment he stood back up, he stabbed one of my coworkers in the stomach. I was shocked as I saw blood spraying from her. In the heat of the moment, I shoved the man against the chair, and he fell down. That gave me and the other coworker enough time to help our injured friend out of the room. Just as he got up and began to run towards us with that knife, I quickly closed and locked the door. I then took out my phone and called for help, asking for an ambulance and police. Nolan's dad was yelling and screaming from the office. I'll kill you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me? I was shaking. I couldn't believe what was happening. I tried to calm down. I needed to help my injured coworker, but I just couldn't stop crying. The police and ambulance came here very quickly after my call and they arrested him. Paramedics took my coworker to the hospital. As the police were taking Nolan's father to their car, he continued to yell. I'll find you, and I'll get you. I'll kill you. Trembling like never before, I watched as the police took Nolan to the station. Some other officers took reports from me and my other coworker. After that, I called my fiancé, and he picked me up at the kindergarten. I shared the story with him. He was even more shocked than I was. How could someone do something like that? He wondered. After a few days, I heard from my injured coworker that she would be fine. The wound wasn't too deep. That was a relief. But even more joy came when I heard that Nolan's dad got a life sentence in prison. Despite his punishment, I was sad and angry. Why didn't I just call the police? My stubbornness nearly got my coworker killed. After a few months, my husband and I switched towns again. I just couldn't work and live there anymore. Every time I came to that kindergarten, images flooded my mind. Images of blood, a knife, and yelling from Nolan's dad. I needed a fresh start. Nowadays, I work at a preschool in my new town, I even have two kids of my own. I'm in touch with one of my old co-workers, and she let me know that Nolan has a new family, and now he's the happiest boy she's ever seen. I'm glad I managed to help Nolan, but to this day I can't process what happened. Can someone really be that cold-blooded? What if we didn't have my co-workers with me that day? Would he really have just killed me on the spot? One thing is sure, from now on, I'll be calling the police first. The Basement From Martin I've always been the kind of person who believes in what they can see and touch. Ghosts, spirits, and otherworldly things, not in my book. I'm 42, divorced, and a father of two amazing kids. After the separation, I took a job as the nighttime janitor to pay the bills and to avoid paying for childcare. It was at an old downtown office building in the heart of Cincinnati, Ohio. That building had a long history, serving as everything from a bank to a library over the years. By the time I started, it was mostly rented out to tech startups and law firms. My first week there was pretty mundane, the building, despite its age, was well maintained. My duties include cleaning the bathrooms, vacuuming the floors, 
emptying trash bins, and occasionally fixing a faulty light. The place was huge, and sometimes the long, silent corridors could give me the chills. But there were no ghosts to worry about, just the occasional mouse or two. One Thursday night after finishing the fourth floor, I decided to take a break in one of the empty offices. This one in particular had a large window overlooking the downtown area. The city was beautifully lit, and the room was comfortable and silent. As I began to sip at my coffee, I heard what sounded like soft weeping coming from the hallway. Initially, I brushed it off, thinking it might be a leaky faucet or the wind from outside. But as I listened more intently, there was no denying it. Someone was crying. I felt a mix of curiosity and concern. I grabbed my flashlight and stepped into the corridor. The sound seemed to be coming from the end of the hallway, near the old storeroom. As I approached, the crying grew louder. It was a woman's voice, filled with so much pain. Thinking someone might be hurt, I quickened my pace, but when I reached the storeroom door and opened it, the crying abruptly stopped. The room was empty, save for old furniture and boxes. I called out, Hello? Anyone here? But there was no answer. Confused, I started to search the room. Then I noticed it, a small vent near the bottom of the wall. The sound must have traveled through the ventilation system. That meant the crying was coming from somewhere else in the building. Determined to help, I decided to follow the sound. I journeyed down to the third floor, then the second. The crying seemed to move as I did, always just out of reach. When I made it to the ground floor, the sobbing was clearer than ever. It was definitely coming from the basement. Now, I'd been in the basement only once, during my orientation. It was where the old bank vaults were. The place had a heavy, damp atmosphere, and I remember feeling a bit uneasy. But that was during the day. This was night. With every step I took down the creaky wooden stairs, the sobbing grew louder. But as I reached the basement, there was a sudden shift. The crying was replaced by a chilling silence. So I called out again. Hello? Do you need help? No response. With my flashlight guiding me, I walked deeper into the basement. And then I stumbled upon a horrific sight. A small makeshift room had been set up with worn out carpets and old blankets. In the center was a metal chain attached to the wall. And at the end of that chain was a collar. My heart pounded as I realized someone had been held captive here. The crying, it had to be coming from them. But where were they now? Before I could process everything, I heard a low growl behind me. I spun around and was met with the sinister glare of a man, dirty and unkempt, holding a knife. You shouldn't be here, he hissed. And that's where my memory fails me, because the next thing I knew, I woke up in a hospital bed. Apparently, a security guard had heard the commotion and found me unconscious in the basement. The police were involved, and an investigation began. I was told the man had been living secretly in the basement for months. The crying? Well, that came from a woman he had kidnapped. Thankfully, she was found and rescued from a different location. The man was arrested, but the damage was done. The terror I felt that night would stay with me forever. And as for the building, I never set foot there again. The days following that incident were a blur of police statements, therapy sessions, and sleepless nights. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw that basement, heard the crying, and felt the cold glare of the man with the knife. The trauma left scars on my mind that refused to heal. The city was abuzz with the story. It turned out the man was a former employee of one of the tech companies in the building. After being fired, instead of leaving, he hid in the building, creating this sinister lair in the basement. 
Over time, he became obsessed with a co-worker, leading to the eventual kidnapping. For weeks after, my kids stayed with their mother. The sight of their dad with hollowed out eyes and a shaken spirit was too much for them. It was during one of our supervised visits that my daughter, Lily, gave me a drawing. It was of me holding a mop with a big smile on my face, standing outside the building. You're my hero, daddy, she said, because you found the lady and you made sure she was safe. Her words were a balm to my wounded soul. They reminded me that even in the darkest moments, there's a glimmer of hope and strength. I decided to attend therapy more regularly, focusing on healing and moving forward. As the months passed, I found a new janitorial job at a local high school. The environment was lighter there, and the memories of that fateful night started to fade. While I remained skeptical of the paranormal, I did become a firm believer in monsters, the ones that hide within the hearts of people. One day, as I was cleaning the school gym, I found a note on my cart. It read, Thank you for saving me that night. Every day I wake up, I'm grateful for your bravery. The note wasn't signed, but I knew who it was from. That simple act of gratitude made me realize, in some twisted way, the incident had brought a deeper sense of purpose to my life. I wasn't just a janitor. I had at least at one point been a beacon of hope for someone in their darkest hour. Over time, the scars began to heal. While the memories never truly faded, they became reminders of resilience and the indomitable human spirit. Every so often, when I walk past an old building or hear a distant cry, I'm reminded of that night, of the depths of human cruelty, and of the strength we find in ourselves when faced with unspeakable horror. Creature Near the Old Oak From Hot Chocolate This happened two or three months ago, in the middle of summer. I work as an arborist. People call us tree surgeons. If you're unfamiliar with our job, we basically take care of trees. We plant new trees, transplant old ones, we remove tree stumps, trim them to remove dead leaves or branches, you get the gist. One day after the day's briefing, I was sent to a small park to diagnose a particular tree. It was pretty close to the main trail, and a few folks had already sent in reports about it to the county office. The county contacted my boss, then my boss sent me to check it out and report back. I got there around noon. The sun hung high in the sky, casting a warm golden glow over the small park as I made my way toward the tree in question. The park itself was beautiful, filled with all sorts of trees and bushes, nestled right in the heart of the town. Lush greenery surrounded me, with a vibrant tapestry of flowers in full bloom. There weren't a lot of people, though. Probably had better things to do than to walk around under the scorching sun. After a bit of a walk, I got to the tree. It stood high on a small hill. As I approached it, I could see why it had become a cause for concern. The leaves that should have been a vibrant green were instead a dull, sickly yellow. Several branches appeared brittle and lifeless, and the bark displayed ominous signs of decay. I took out my notepad and began to jot down my initial observations and thoughts. The tree in question was an old oak, its gnarled trunk telling a story of decades of growth and resilience. The park visitors had clearly grown fond of it, as evidenced by the worn-out bench beneath its shade. As I continued my examination of the tree, I got completely engrossed in my task, completely focused on identifying the source of its distress. It was when I knelt down to inspect the base of the tree, near its roots, that I sensed something was wrong. It was like the air grew still then, and an eerie silence descended upon the entire park. My heart began to beat rapidly, and a sudden feeling of dread started creeping up on me. I glanced around, trying to scan the area for any unusual movement. At first I thought that maybe I was worried over nothing, that my head was just playing tricks on me. But then I heard it, 
a soft, rhythmic tapping sound, like someone or something was approaching. I stood up slowly, my heart quickening its beat. The tapping grew louder, echoing through the park. Panic began to well up within me as I realized it was only getting closer. Then I saw it. A man stood a few feet ahead of me. I would have said I felt relieved to have someone else there, but I would be lying because something felt very wrong about him. I couldn't see his face clearly because his head was in an unnatural position, looking slightly upwards toward the sky. But from what I could see, his face looked off. It looked like an AI tried to recreate a person's face, or if you've tried to remember someone's face from a dream. I tried to speak out, to say hello or can I help you, or do you need something? But no matter how hard I tried, nothing came out of my mouth. I was frozen with fear, something primal, the type of fear I imagine prey animals have when they're face to face with a predator. I was unable to say or do anything. I just stood there, watching him. After about a minute of me staring at the man, something finally happened. The man began to speak, with his head still facing towards the sky. But the words that came out of his mouth didn't sound right. He kept repeating a few lines that didn't correlate to one another, in a shaky, raspy voice. I don't remember everything he said, but I do remember a few. Help. What do you want? Over there. But the way he said those words were all wrong. Mispronunciations, voice cracks, odd tones. Then he looked at me. Now I could see his face clearly. God, how I wish I could erase what I saw from my mind. His face was completely malformed. But what stuck out to me the most were his eyes. They were deathly pale, and it looked as if a part of his irises and pupils were missing. I can't really explain it better than that. Then that creature started opening its mouth wide, impossibly wide, until it seemed like its jaw might dislocate. At long last, my body responded to my desperate pleas to move, and I ran like I never had before. I ran all the way to my car and drove off without ever looking back. After some time had passed and I calmed down, I gave a half-hearted report about the tree and clocked out for the day. I still work as an arborist, but from now on I avoid any tasks where I would be working alone. My friend's experiences as a police officer from Cricket Girl 20. From the ages of 21 through 24, my friend Oliver was a police officer. He was older than me, but we were close. He would often tell me about his job, about the good, and the bad. But when he turned 23, something changed. One night at around 1.30 a.m., he knocked on my door. It startled me awake. I opened the door and said, Goodness, Oliver, it's the middle of the night. You okay? My tone of voice changed when I saw the look on his face. I told him to come in, and he sat down on the couch. I gave him some hot chocolate and asked him, What's wrong, Oliver? He rotated the mug in his hand for a bit, then said, Abby left me. I sat there for a second, then he started to cry. I pulled him in for a hug and asked, Why did she leave? He sat back up, wiped his tears, and replied, Because of my experiences on patrols, I've been seeing things... Well, a ghost, I think. I put my hand on his shoulder and said, Well, tell me about these experiences. He looked at me and hesitated for a minute. Then he began. Well, it started when we responded to a call of a young lady whose car got flipped. By the time my partner and I arrived, the car was in flames. I tried getting her out, but the heat was too much 
and I had no choice but to take cover as the car exploded. I was upset, but I knew I couldn't do anything about it. After that, well, I started to see her everywhere, and she would always have this evil look on her face. I think she was angry with me. The first time I saw her was at home that same night. I just got finished showering, and when I opened the shower curtain, for a split second, I saw her. But she was gone so quickly. When I told Abby, she just said I was seeing things. She started to pop up at the department, the store, even the doctor's office. The second time I saw her was at the department. I was in the bathroom when I looked in the mirror, and I saw her there with that same evil look on her face. I even told my partner, and he laughed, saying, Dude, you just feel guilty. The next day I saw her in my bedroom. Maybe it was a dream, but I don't think it was. She spoke to me then. She said, You let me die. Now I will take something from you. That night, my partner and I had the night patrol. We were driving down this dirt road, when a man ran across the road, causing me to slam on my brakes. This man ran off into an abandoned house. Worried, the two of us ran after him. We split up, but a couple of minutes later, I heard a gunshot. I ran to make sure my partner was okay. I found him on the ground, a bullet wound to the chest. That man had shot my partner and ran off. I radioed for backup and held my partner in my arms. He said one last thing to me, asking me to tell his mom he loved her. Then he passed away. I felt someone in the room with me then, and when I looked up, I saw that same girl, the same evil grin on her face. She whispered, Now I've taken something from you. I went home later that night, drowning my sorrows in whiskey. Abby hugged me and said she was sorry. I went back to work a week after and kept seeing her everywhere I went. I was constantly going to the bar. My supervisor told me I needed to take more time off. I did, but it did nothing to ease the pain of losing my partner. Abby was too busy working to listen to me and I didn't want to burden you at the time. I requested to be a solo officer. I didn't want to have a new partner just yet. One night while on patrol, I looked in the back seat, and I found her there, smiling that awful grin. I slammed on the brakes so fast, I then looked in the back seat and saw that she was gone. I even tried going to a therapist, but it didn't do any good. This all happened a year ago, and I'm still seeing her. I should have saved her. Abby finally had enough of me complaining about it. She broke up with me. I didn't know where else to come tonight. After he finished telling me his story, I gave him a hug again and said, Oliver, listen, you did everything you could to save her, and I'm sorry with what happened with Abby. I don't think she understood what you were going through, but I think you're a great guy. Oliver fell asleep on my couch. Soon after that, he quit the force. He turned in his gun and badge, and eventually, he did stop seeing the woman. It was so good seeing him happy again. Unfortunately, not too long ago, Oliver passed away from cancer. By the time it was detected, it was too late for him. Before passing, Oliver got a dog to help him with his troubles. He made me promise if anything happened to him that I would take the dog, and I kept that promise. Sometimes I can sense Oliver is around me, and I miss him every day. Quiet Nights from T. Fox I work in a small library in a rural town of North Carolina. Our town is small with a population of roughly 2,000. 
The kind of place where everybody knows everybody, and most of us have gone to school together at some point. So it's really a good sense of community and safety. The night was the same as any other. I was working overnight, sorting books, logging them into the brand new computer, and getting the other books ready to be sent out the following morning. My book trolley was settled in front of the desk, loaded with books to go back on the shelves, and a few drawings the children made, which was to go on a wall in the children's section. I'd logged in the last book for the evening, looking for my coworker Alex, who usually helped me put some books on the higher shelves, but he was nowhere to be seen. I figured he was in the restroom, so I just got started on the drawings. I crossed the front room, going down a small hallway. I was a bit tired at that point, so I didn't think anything of it when the light in the children's room was off. It took a moment of fumbling before I got the fluorescent lights to burst into life, which revealed that some books had been scattered across the floor, and the character plushies from the top of the shelves had now been placed on top of a few of these scattered books. I was bewildered. I was just in this room earlier in the evening. There were no books or plushies on the floor as I left. Perhaps Alex had accidentally knocked into a shelf. I set the drawings down on a nearby table, and I got to work, putting A Wrinkle in Time, some Narnia books, and a few others back on the shelf, and I even placed a stuffed Pikachu back on its little rocking chair, which was perched atop the manga section. I frowned, wondering how Alex could have been so clumsy. Usually he's a very careful person, but I shrugged it off. I got some thumbtacks from the desk and pinned the drawings up onto the back wall of the room. I then turned, and I heard something shuffling behind me. The Pikachu was back on the floor again. At this point, I was a bit annoyed, confused, even slightly startled. I sat the Pikachu firmly back upon the chair, making sure it wouldn't move again, just in case I hadn't set it in the doll-sized chair before. Maybe I just didn't place it right. Stay put, I muttered. I looked on my book trolley and picked out a few Animorphs to put back on the shelves. As I turned to put them up, I let out a mix of a gasp of shock and a frustrated grunt. There on the ground was Pikachu again. But in addition to the little yellow mouse was another plush, now sitting on the rug in the middle of the room. I grabbed my phone, fully convinced that Alex was messing with me. I heard his phone ring across the hallway, and I swear I felt my hands grow cold. He was in the main room, so there was absolutely no way he could have snuck past me like that. Hello, Heather? He asked, having picked up his phone. I was at a loss for words for a moment. You, uh, you're in the main room, right? He hung up, rather rudely, I thought and walked into the children's room, looking at me firmly. I was? Why? I pointed at the plushes on the floor. You're not messing with me? Did we check if everyone was gone from the building? He walked over, picking up the plushes and setting them down where they were supposed to go. Look, I'm sure nobody's in here. We've both walked the building back and forth. And I wasn't messing with you. In fact, when I got out of the bathroom, I came looking for you. I pinched my lips together, firmly, for a second, before deciding to brush this off. Again, maybe I just didn't set the plushes down properly. Okay, well, take the trolley, and please put up the higher books. I must have not set them right. He tugged on the metal handle of the trolley, giving me a long look. I think you might need some rest. This is your third day in a row and you look tired. Why don't you go get some coffee? I've got this. I sighed, pushing my glasses up my nose, before nodding, knowing he was right. Yeah, thanks for that. I'll take a break in a moment. I have one more book to put back. He nodded, pushing the trolley out the door and down the hallway. I took the last Animorphs book and placed it on the shelf. I then took a glance around the room and nearly lost my nerve. There was a small shadow, barely as tall as my hip, reaching for a plush on the shelf. I froze, not sure what to do as the plush went to the floor 
and the shadows seemed to look at me. I lost it. I must have, because all I remember is screaming and the shadow vanishing, sinking into the floor beside the new plush. Alex came running back in, his feet heavy on the wooden floor. Hey, hey, what's wrong? What's Aslan doing on the floor? Heather, did you see something? Did something fall on you? He was holding a heavy dictionary like a weapon. I stood in absolute, horrified shock before shaking my head and then telling him what I saw. He walked the aisles with the dictionary held tight in his grip. I don't see anyone. Are you sure you saw something? Yes, I'm sure, Alex. My voice was stern, but I was absolutely shaking. I felt like the air was too thick in the room, so I stepped out into the hallway. Look, just come with me for the evening, okay? I can't do this today. He looked at me, putting the dictionary down. I think you need to go home and sleep. Shadow children, of all things, to see? I gave a frustrated sigh. It's true, though. I looked over, seeing a small hand shove a series of unfortunate events onto the floor. Alex whirled around, gaping at the sudden mess. Did you... I was already halfway into the main room, refusing to deal with that. Nope, I'm not dealing with it either, I called back. Alex quickly left the room, joining me in the main room. So, that? Yeah. I knew he didn't have much more to say on the topic, so we just agreed to never speak of it again. Things still happen to this day. Plushes flying off shelves, books toppling over, figures of children and many other things. I'm starting to get used to it, but it will always send a shot of fear up my spine. Tales from the Break Room is a viewer-submitted podcast featuring allegedly true scary stories that happened on the way to, on the way from, or at work. If you want your story to be narrated on the show, send it to us at eeriecast.com submit. As of April 14th, we're paying three cents per word for stories that are approved and make it onto the show. Submission does not guarantee approval or payment. For a limited time only, PayPal only. Tales from the Break Room is an EerieCast network original podcast hosted by Darkness Prevails. You can follow him on Twitter at Dark Prevails, and you can hear thousands more stories read by him on our other show, Unexplained Encounters. If you enjoyed this episode, please follow and rate Tales from the Break Room on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. You can also enjoy plenty more horror-themed podcasts at EerieCast.com. <laughs>